Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to any one of these problems, you will find the original solutions in day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 286. Please turn to it. Page number 286, problem number 127. The problem is already on the blackboard. Here's what the problem says. It says that our rent from number 127, we are told that our rent went up by X percent. Our rent has gone up from X percent from 97 to 98. The next year, the rent actually goes down. It goes down by Y percent from 98 to 99. And the question is very straightforward, very simple. Did our rent actually go up overall from 97 to 99? Let's see what, let's see what we can do here. We're going to look at a couple of scenarios and see, see what happens here. Obviously, we can't simply go by the fact that x is more than y in the first statement. Or oh, we have not written down the first statement. First, in the first statement, they tell us that x is more than y. And the x is, x is more than y. In the first statement, they tell us that x is more than y. So we're looking at the first statement. We're working with the information from the first statement. And simply, simply knowing that x is more than y, we cannot simply leap to conclusion that uh, rent must have gone up because the increase is more than a decrease. The percentage increase x we are told is more than the percentage drop in y. That will be silly, we know, because the base is going to change. For example, for example, let's look at simple, very simple scenario, very straightforward scenario. They said that we have a 25% increase, a 25% increase from 97 to 98. So if we start out with $100 rent, just to keep our math simple, if we're going to pretend that our rent was 90, in 97 was $100, a 25% increase will increase our rent to $125. A 25% increase, this 25% increase is our x. Then the following year, we have a 20% drop. A 20% drop is our y. As you can see, we are obeying these conditions here. x is more than y. The percentage increase here, x, 25%, is more than percentage drop, which is 20%. But in 98, our rent was $125. And if we were to drop, if we were to drop by 20%, 20% is one-fifth. One-fifth of 125, one-fifth of 125 is $25. 20%, 20% is one-fifth, and one-fifth of 125, one-fifth of 125 is 25. So the rent is going to drop by $25, and we're going to be back to where we started, which is $100. So did our rent go up? We started at $97 we ended up at $99 by $100. The question was, did our rent go up? The answer in this case, the answer in this scenario is no, the rent did not go up. The rent did not go up from 97 to 99. We ended up exactly where we started from, which is a rent of $100. On the other hand, second scenario might be, again, we have a 25% increase, 25% increase from 97 to 98, again, from $100, $100 to $125, but this time we have a drop, we have a drop of only 10% from 98 to 99. If you have a drop of only 10% from 90, if you have a drop of only 10% from 98 to 99, then in 98, this, this handwriting is atrocious. If you have a drop of 10% from 98 to 99, in 98 we ended up with 125 dollars. A drop of 10%, 10% of 125 is $12.50. So if you subtract $12.50 from $125, we're going to end up with $112.50. So did the rent go up from 97 to 98? Well, in this scenario, of course, we started out with $100 rent in 97. We ended up with $112 in, 90, in 99. So in this scenario, did the rent go up? The answer is yes. And of course, in both cases, our x is more than y. X was 25% here, same thing here, X is 25%, the increase is 25%, and the Y in this case, a drop of 10%, this is our Y, or Y is 
Again, x is more than y. That's the condition we have to meet. The first condition, the first statement tells us that x is more than y. But that information that they, that, that they give us in the first statement, that x is more than y, apparently is not enough. It's, there's not sufficient data for us to know for a fact that the rent actually did go up uh, or rent definitely did not go up from 97 to 99. The first statement is not enough. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we establish that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now answer cannot be B or D. It will have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Just give me one quick second here for my break. Lost it. I didn't mean to erase that part. A, D. B, C, E. The first statement, what did we find out? The first statement was not enough. We passed out A and D. Let's look at second statement. Let's find out what they tell us in the second statement. In the second statement, number 127, they tell us, oh my god, they're telling us that x times y over 100 is less than x minus y. To which, yes, you're absolutely right, to which we would say, what the hell? What, is, what are we supposed to do with this bloody thing? This is pretty ugly looking thing here. X times Y, X times Y over 100 is less than X minus Y. What the bloody hell do you expect me to do with it? Well, obviously it's a very, very much of an algebraic statement. The statement that is given in the second state, in the second, second uh, statement, that's redundant here. The, the, the information that is given in the second statement is very much of an algebraic nature. And therefore, we have no choice but to tackle it, but to analyze it in an algebraic fashion. Now, keep listening, okay? Listen very carefully. If you are one of those people who is not very good in algebra, then what I'm about to do is not something that you're cut out for. Cut your losses, pick one answer choice among the remaining three, and move on to the next problem, had you been taking the real exam right now. It's okay. It's okay to cut your losses, uh, to fall uh, while you're ahead, and move on. Do you understand? You must know when to hold and when to fall. Do you, do you understand? Kenny Roger was a, was a wise man. You must listen to him. So this is an algebraic expression. We have no choice but to analyze this, analyze this algebraically as we said. Let's see what we can do, shall we? Let's see what we can do. We need a lot of room. I don't know why I wrote this thing here. Let's put down the second statement right here. Second statement tells us that x times y over 100 is less than x minus y. Okay, it's less than x minus y. Let's put it here and let's erase everything. I'm going to erase everything, the, even the top part, because we need a lot of room. Well, our rent, our rent in 1997, in 1997, our rent was the starting pr starting place uh, that uh, that our base price. Let's call it R dollar. We started out with R dollar. Okay, watch what happens. It's going to get quite algebraic, quite complicated, very uh, very soon, and I won't have the luxury of, of explaining every single step here. So if something gives you trouble, as I said, cut your losses and pick one answer choice and move on. What happened in 98? In 98, we are told that it went up, went up by x percent. How do we how do we how do we represent that? Well x percent of this amount, so whatever our original rent was, then we have to add to it x percent of that amount. X percent of that amount is x over 100 times r. Are you with me? Let's take out the r common. If we take out the r common from this statement we, we first from this term we are left with one and from this term we are going to be left with x over 100. So far, so good. Let's go to the next year. 1999, we are told that the, uh, the rent uh, went, went down by y percent. So whatever this amount is, whatever this amount is, we have to subtract from it y percent of this amount. So this amount we start out with, which is, which is r times 1 plus x over 100 
and now from that we have to subtract minus minus y percent y percent is y over 100 of the same quantity r times 1 plus x over 100 as you can get, as you, as you can see it's getting quite ugly quite rapidly let's see what we can do with it now it's written in this fashion I put down the word minus here just for emphasis but it, that's what it is this is our first term if it makes it easier for you to see if it makes it easier for you to see we can actually write this statement this statement right here that you see here 1999 we can write it here in, in, in horizontal form so you can see it r ta times r times 1 plus x over 100 minus minus r times y over r times y over 100 times 1 plus x over 100. We can clearly see that uh, we have two terms that are common here. We have this, this quantity that is common here, 1 plus, 1 plus x over 100, and we have r that is common here. Let's take it out common. So r times 1 plus x over 100, if we take out common, then from this first quantity we are left with, we took out the whole thing, r times 1 plus x, so we took out everything, so we are just left with 1. Here we took out this guy, we took out this guy, we are left with this guy. And it's going to be minus, right here, it's a minus, right here is a minus, you see? Minus this guy right here, y over 100. This is our, this is our final rent. The question is, is this rent more than what we started out with. That's what the question is. The question is, is our final rent, this is, the, this is the rent in 99. Is this amount more than what we started out with? Let's find out, shall we? So that's what we have to answer now. We have to answer now. Let's put the question on the top now. We can erase everything here and we're going to put down the question. The question is, is this quantity that you see here, r times 1 plus x over 100 times 1 minus y over 100 greater than what we started out with. That's the question. If we can answer that question, we are home free. Let's see what we can do. Well, very first thing we notice is that the r appears on both sides of the inequality. And since R is a positive quantity, how do we know R is a positive quantity? I looked into it, I looked into it thoroughly, and I had a very tough time where a landlord would rent a store to you and say, please rent the store from me, I will pay you $5,000 every month if you rent my store from me. I'm being silly, of course. Rent cannot be negative. This quantity of R is always going to be positive because it's rent. And therefore, since it's a positive quantity, we can divide both sides of the inequality by r without having to worry about switching the direction of the inequality. So let's divide both sides of the inequality by r. And if we do that, the r is going to drop out and we end up with 1 plus x over 100 times 1 minus y over 100. And the question is, is this more than 1? Is this more than 1? That's what we have to answer. Let's open this parenthesis. I need the room, I need a lot of room, so I have, I have no choice but to raise the bottom part. We always go at a leisurely pace because we are not taking the exam right now, we are learning right now. Okay, just calm down and just learn. If you learn the material, you can always apply it in the exam. First you have to learn the material, first you have to master the material before you worry about the speed. Do you understand? The simile that I always use is, it's like learning how to ride a bike how to ride a bicycle. You cannot worry about how fast you can go. We have to first learn how to ride the damn thing. Do you understand? That's it. Those were my, those were my words of wisdom from the Far East. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times y over 100 with a negative here is going to be negative y over 100. And then x over, x over 100 times 1 is going to be x over 100. x over 100 times 1. And then we're going to have x over 100 times y over 100 with the minus sign. So it's minus x times y, x times y over 100 squared. The question is, is this quantity more than 1? That's what we want to answer. Are you with me? 
is this quantity more than 1? Again, 1 appears on both sides of the inequality. We can subtract 1 from both sides of the inequality and, and get rid of the damn thing. That's it. Let's see what we can do next. Let's see what we can do next. Let's bring, let's bring this quantity, x times y over 100 square on that side by adding this quantity to both sides. And if we do that, we end up with x over 100 minus y over 100 on this side is greater than and bring this quantity x times y over 100 squared on the other side on the other side we can put this we can put this x minus y we can put this x minus y together because they both have the same denominator they have the same denominator let's put them together x minus y over 100 now 100 appears here, 100 appears here. If we were to divide, if we were to multiply both sides of the inequality by 100, this is 100 times 100. If we were to multiply both sides of the inequality by 100, if we were to multiply both sides of the inequality by 100, we can get rid of this 100, and this 100 is going to go away with that 100, and what we end up is x minus y is greater than x over y times 100. That is what we have to answer. If we can somehow establish that, if we can somehow establish that, that x minus y is greater than x over x, if, if we can establish somehow that x minus y is greater than x times y over 100, then the answer is yes. Did the rent go up? The answer is yes, because this quantity is bigger than that quantity. Let's see what they tell us in the second statement, shall we? I'm very curious. In the second statement, they tell us, in the second statement, they tell us that x, x times y over 100 is less than x minus y. What do you know? Voila. The second statement does the job quite nicely because it actually tells us what we needed to know at the very end. The second statement is enough. The second statement by, by itself does the job quite nicely. But as I told you from the very beginning, it wasn't meant for everybody. It wasn't meant for everybody. Let's do the next one, shall we? Number 128. This was actually a lot of fun. If you know what's going on, if you can do it with speed, actually, it's actually quite enjoyable. Even though I say so myself, yes. As I always remind you, that is what makes us geek. In this 128, we are told that uh, hypotenuse of the right angle triangle. So we're given a right angle triangle here. Let's call it ABC. And we are told that the hypotenuse is 10. Hypotenuse is 10. It says the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is 10. The question simply is what's the parameter? What's the parameter? Let's call this x and y x and y. So the question here is how much is the perimeter of this guy? Which is same as saying how much is x plus y plus 10 equals to how much? That's what we have to answer. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement, shall we? In the first statement they tell us, in the first statement they tell us that the area of the triangle, area of the triangle ABC is 25. Let's see what we can do with it. How do we find area of a triangle? Area of the triangle is 1 half base times height, we are told, is 25. Base times height, our base is x and height is h. So x times y is going to be 25 times 2. That's what they tell us. It tells us that x times y equals 50. That's what the first statement tells us. We, are, we know now that x times y has to equal 50. Question is, is there anything we can do with it? Is this information, is this data, the data that we have in our hand, x times y equals 50, is this data going to be sufficient for us to somehow answer the question that is being asked? How much is this quantity? Now what you have to, what you have to understand from the very beginning is that, this part, you see? I'm going to rewrite this thing so you can see it. We do not have to figure out the value of x and y individually. If we could figure out the value of y, uh, x and y individually, even better. But we don't have to. All we have to be able to do, uh, all we have to be able to do here to be able to answer the question, what's the parameter of this thing here, is simply to figure out what their sum is. 
If we can figure out the sum of x and y, we can answer the question. It's just plus 10 is the answer. So we don't have to figure out the x and y separately. Let's see what we can do here. Well, what we do know is an identity. An identity, a very simple identity that every, every school child knows. There are three formulas in the exam that you must know. One has to do with a plus, I'm going to write all of them down here. One has to do with a plus b whole squared. The other one has to do with a minus b whole squared. And the other one has to do with a squared minus b squared. You must know these three. You must know these three by heart because they come in quite handy. Let's use the first one. We know that x plus y whole squared equals x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Everybody knows that. Let's rewrite this thing. Let's rewrite this thing as x squared plus y squared plus 2 times xy. Okay. Watch where we're going with this thing. Now, what do you, if you look at this triangle, what do you gather from it? 10 is the hypotenuse. Are you able to see immediately that because this is a right angle triangle, from this triangle what we gather is, from this triangle what we gather is that, I, I don't have the room here, so that's why I'm raising here, is that we can write it here. Let's make it a smaller triangle so I have a little bit more room. This is, this is 10. So 10 squared has to equal x squared plus y squared. 10 squared, because 10 is the hypotenuse, b to c we are saying is 10, 10 is the hypotenuse, therefore 10 squared has to be x squared plus y squared because it's a right angle triangle. x squared plus y squared is 10 squared. Let's put it in here. Plus 2 times xy, 2 times xy, which we just found out is 50. We're done. So, x plus y, x plus y whole squared, x plus y whole squared equals 10 squared which is 100 plus 2 times 50 which is another 100 it is 200 and therefore x plus y x plus y is square root of 200 is the square root of 200 that's it we did it we did it x plus y is square root of 200 and this is 10 and that's your parameter voila we did find, we did manage to find the parameter of the triangle that is given to us. The parameter happens to be square root of 200 plus the 10. That's all. Square root of 200 plus the 10. The first statement does the job quite beautifully. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that you established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or E. Oh no, first statement is enough. Bloody hell. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we've established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement, shall we? We need the room, obviously, and I need the break. In the second statement they tell us, in the second statement they tell us that the triangle that we're dealing with is an isosceles triangle. So we do know that the hypotenuse is we know that it's a right angle triangle. We are told that in the beginning. We also told that the hypotenuse is we also told that hypotenuse is 10. That part does not change. That part applies to the whole problem. In addition to that, we are told in the second statement. That is actually an isosceles triangle. It is an isosceles triangle. So we no longer have x and y, we have x and x. These two sides are equal. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's see what we can do with it. Well, in an in a, in a, in a, in a, in a isosceles triangle, in an isosceles triangle, we know that the sides are arranged in this ratio. Uh, the, uh, this is a right angle triangle, and these two sides are equal, then this is going to be 1. 1 root 2. Let's call it x, x, and root 2 times x. Okay, keep listening. We need the room, obviously. And I'm going to erase all of these as well. So, what's going on here is that this side of the here, root 2 times x, we are told is 10. Root 2 times x has to equal 10. Let's, let's uh, square both sides. It's very simple actually. We, we, we're going to figure out the value of x and once we have the value of x, we are done. 
square both sides and we find out that 2 times square both sides. Is that going to get us anywhere? No, let's not square both sides. Let's just leave it the way it is. If we square both sides, we're going to end up with x squared. So this, te this tells us that x equals to x equals to 10 over root 2. That's it, we're done. That's it. Simple as that. And therefore the perimeter, perimeter is going to be uh, 10 over root 2 plus 10 over root 2 plus 10. This is 10 over root 2. This is 10 over root 2. 10 over root, not 10 over root 2. I keep saying 10 over root 2. 10 times root 2. 10 times root 2 plus 10 times root 2. Oh, I wrote the, oh, it is 10 over root 2. Oh, uh, hell. 10 over root 2, 10 over root 2, plus 10. That's all it is. Let's see what we can do with it. Which is same as 2 times 10 over root 2, plus 100. And of course, 2 can be written as root 2 times root 2. I'm making too much fuss here. Let's do it here. Let's do it here. We're going to pick up from here. So it's going to be 2 times 10 2 times 10 over root 2 plus 10. And this 2, this 2 that we see here, this 2 can be written as root 2 times root 2. Of course, I'm, I'm showing obvious things. So what we end up here is 10, this 10 right here, plus root 2 times 10. Root 2 times 10. And I'm going to show you I'm going to show you that the perimeter that we found in the first statement is the exact same quantity. In the first statement we found that it was square root of 200. The square root of 200 is what we found the perimeter to be. The square root of 200 can be written as square root of 2 times 100. Square root of 2 times 100 which can be written as 10 root 2 plus a 10. Plus a 10. Well, you get the idea. Plus a ten, and it's the exact same quantity. I can't, I can't leave this quantity. It's the exact same quantity as that quantity. Of course, as we always point out, that the informations, the the informations that we get from the two statements, they never contradict each other. The point here is that it is quite simple. It is quite easy in the second statement to figure out the perimeter because this hypotenuse we are told is ten, and that has to equal to root two times x, and we can figure out the x. In reality, of course, in, in the real exam, of course, we would not have done any of this thing. This, this, is, this, this is just for learning purposes, you understand? It will be sheer waste of time in the real exam to actually sit there and do it all out. All we have to understand is that if hypotenuse is 10, which is root 2 times x, if we know that 10 equals root 2 times x, let's do it here. If we understand that 10 equals root 2 times x, of course we can figure out the value of the x from there. And as long as we can figure out the value of the x from there, we can figure out the parameter. It's just x plus x plus root 2 times 10. That's it. The, the second statement does the job quite nicely. The answer to this problem turns out to be d. The first statement was enough, and so is the second statement. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.